Hello everyone, Julian Charles here of TheMindRenewed.com, podcasting to you as usual from the depths of the Lancashire countryside here in the UK. Now today we have a slightly different kind of interview. Normally, as you know, we tend to concentrate on a particular subject matter and look into that in some detail. But this time I invited our guest to come on the show essentially to talk about his life story. And our guest is Dr. Stanley Monteith, who will be known, I'm quite sure, to most of you as the host of Radio Liberty, who has been broadcasting out of California for five hours a day and five days a week for a little over the last 20 years. And bringing, as indeed Dr. Stan himself nearly always says at the start of his shows, bringing us the story behind the story, the news behind the news. And as always, it was a delight to speak with Dr. Stan, who I've been listening to on and off since Radio Liberty began in the early 1990s. First via my little shortwave radio, where I always had to adjust the tuning to keep in track with the atmospheric changes so I could keep listening to the show, which uh, always had a kind of uh, romantic charm about it. I think that, that struggle to hear, you know, perhaps enhancing my desire to hear what was being said all the more. And then, of course, much more conveniently, but much more prosaically over the Internet. And I will say straight away that I have gained a great deal from Dr. Stan's work over the years, and I admire him mostly, I would say, for his willingness to take the risk of addressing subjects that the mainstream media generally wouldn't touch or would only do so in a very one-sided, propagandistic kind of way. And that, during a time when, to be quite honest, to be involved in alternative media was really not fashionable at all. And I think that that took some real guts to do. Having said that, I also want to make it clear that I don't always agree with what Dr. Stan says. And even in this interview, we don't always see eye to eye, as I think will be clear from the discussion itself. But as I think I've said a number of times before, I don't think that really matters. My reason for inviting him on was not because I agree with absolutely everything he says, but because I appreciate the kind of thing that he's been doing through all these years, bringing to light important facts and interpretations that might otherwise have remained hidden and exposing darkness to the light. So with that being said, let me just remind you that we're still in summer vacation mode here at The Mind Renewed, so these programmes are still going to come out a bit irregularly until things get back onto an even keel in early September. At least that's what I'm hoping that that will happen in early September. We shall see what actually happens. And so we now move to our interview with Dr. Stanley Monteith. Hello, everybody. This is Julian Charles of TheMindRenewed.com, podcasting to you, as usual, from the depths of the Lancashire countryside here in the UK. And today we have a slightly different kind of program, a different kind of interview. Normally, as you know, on The Mind Renewed, I will invite somebody to come on and discuss a particular subject. But this time I have invited our guest to join us really in order to share something of their own life story. And I'm delighted, therefore, to welcome once again to the program Dr. Stanley Monteith, who joins us over the phone line from his home in California. And Dr. Stanley Monteith is a retired orthopaedic surgeon who for many decades has been researching into the causes of America's spiritual and moral decline and who for the last 20 years or so has been speaking and writing on geopolitical matters and hosting his famous talk radio show Radio Liberty, which is broadcast on shortwave across to the whole world. Dr. Stan, thank you very much for joining us. It's great to be speaking to you again, especially considering all the speaking that you do. I think it's is it five hours a day that you do? Five hours a day, five days a week. Wow. And it's good to be with you. It's great to have you on. I started listening to Radio Liberty, I guess it must have been somewhere around 1990 or thereabouts, and uh, I was very much drawn to your work because you were dealing with a number of subjects that were of concern to me at the time, but which were being hardly addressed at all in the mainstream media, or if they were addressed, you know, it was in a very one-sided kind of way. And so it was a great relief to hear you bringing out various issues on your shows from an alternative viewpoint with articulate voices, articulate guests who were able to give that other side of the argument in many cases. And it was very helpful to me, and I'm I'm sure it was very helpful to so many people over the years. Um, And I know that your ministry approach has also inspired people to follow in your footsteps not just you of course but a handful of others of your generation who were prepared to take that risk and speak out in an alternative way so I'm going to be asking you today about your life and how it is that your experiences led you in the direction of well I'm going to call it researching behind the curtain for want of a better phrase and uh, of course how those experiences ultimately led to your ministry at Radio Liberty. So let's start, quite predictably, at the beginning. 
Could you tell us something about your upbringing, Dr. Stan? Where and when did this all start for you? What was your childhood like? Well, I was born in on February 17th, 1929. I had an older adopted sister, but she had moved out of the house before I began growing up. And uh, so I was basically a single child. My dad was a rug salesman. My mother was a very capable, domineering woman a brilliant mind, uh, capable, whenever she got a job. She was always very, very soon in charge of everything. Uh, but uh, suddenly I was uh, encouraged to excel in everything I did. And with my parents solidly behind me, I was able to move through school very, very quickly. So I graduated from high school when I was 16, moved into college. I was always the youngest and the biggest person in class. I was six foot five and three quarter inches tall. So I was the biggest and the youngest and the most inexperienced of the, the people in my class. I attended the University of California in Berkeley. I was indoctrinated in atheism. I was indoctrinated in globalism. I was indoctrinated in all sorts of things that were true. Went on to take my medical school training. I uh, graduated from medical school in 1952 and then set off on uh, the, the course of my training, took a year of internships, two years in the military, and then the four years of residency to become an orthopedic surgeon. I entered orthopedic practice in the year 1960, and I, I intended uh, simply to be an orthopedic surgeon. But about two years later, I just happened to turn the radio on, and I actually was television, and there was an, an older man there talking about the fact that there was a small group that controlled the world. And uh, his name was Robert Welch. I didn't understand who Robert Welch was. I didn't understand that he was actually working with these people who ruled the world at that time. I mean, it's very difficult to understand that these people who rule the world control both sides. They control their movement to utilize the government of the United States and of Great Britain and other nations in their effort to consolidate control of the world by a small ruling elite. And then they created a controlled opposition that would never be effective. Well, Mr. Welch was part of that controlled opposition. But what he said rang true with me. I set away, got the books that he offered, and suddenly began to see that there was a force working behind the scenes. And the more I read, the more I studied, the more convinced I was uh, that I really had to take a stand and get involved. Now, this pretty well destroyed my religious faith when I was in college. Uh, but suddenly, as I read about what was going on, and realized, of course, that I could very well lose this wonderful utopian existence that we experienced at that time, I began looking for God. And eventually, I came across a minister who gave me an offer I couldn't refuse. He said, look, all you have to do is accept the Lord, get on your knees and accept the Lord. If it's a lie, nothing will change. If it's true, your life will be transformed. Why not just give it a try? Well, I accepted this challenge because I, I had nothing to lose. I didn't know whether Jesus Christ was real, whether Christianity was real. I got on my knees with him, gave my life to the Lord, and my life changed at that time. has never been the same since 1952 when I, I accepted that challenge December of that year. So... It's been a fascinating uh, time since then, we've, and we've had a unique opportunity to talk to people all around the world about what's going on, and to try to expose who these people are who are working behind the scenes. It took me a long time to understand that they already control America. I mean, it's not a matter of will they control America. They control the United States, both political parties, and they're using the financial and military power of the United States to bring about a one-world government. They control England, they control your parliament, and they're using the power of England to bring about this same one world government. Well, of course, we should be talking about many of those issues as we go through the interview. I just want for a moment to go back to this commitment that you made to Christ in, I think you said, 1952. Did you have any kind of Christian upbringing in your early years? Well, my, my parents were nominal Christians, uh, not necessarily evangelical. They recognized God. Uh, they never went to church or seldom went to church. I, I went to church just because of the, of the camaraderie, a chance to meet girls and uh, so need to be part and parcel of a, a youth group. But I never really understood uh, the impact of Christianity, the impact that our Lord can have on our lives. I was a nominal Christian until 1952 when I actually made that 
personal decision to at least take up Christ on his offer, and my life changed. And the life of anyone in the listening audience will change as well if they sincerely want Christ to come into their life. So you did actually have some kind of belief in God as a young man, but you said that when you went to college, they knocked that out of you. Whatever it was that you had was knocked out of you for a while. Well, basically, they do a great job of, of schooling people and indoctrinating people in atheism. And they, uh, every effort was made to destroy the faith of the young people in the classes I was in. And by the time I left college, I was, let's say, an agnostic. It destroyed my basic faith. Hmm. And it really took me some years to actually uh, at least uh, uh, acquire certainly a desire to uh, look for God. And then, of course, that one fateful night when I got on my knees and asked Christ to come into my life, transformed my life forever. Were there any influences in your childhood that you would say encouraged you to kind of think outside the box? Because that's obviously what you've been doing for so many years. Is there anything that sort of led you in that direction in your early days? No, I don't think so. I just always had an inquisitive mind. I never accepted what people said at face value. I always wanted to know why. Mm -hmm. And because that has gotten me into all sorts of trouble during the years. (laughs) But at least we understand what is really going on in the world today far better than the vast majority of the people, and hopefully we're able to educate a few of them so that they can begin making preparations for the terrible times that are coming because we are moving into a period of chaos and crisis and the destruction of civilization as we know it. We do seem to be living in extremely worrying times, absolutely. Can I just go back to this, uh, your, your career just for a moment? Because you said to us that you chose medicine as a career, but then, of course, you ultimately became an orthopedic surgeon. How did your career move in that direction of orthopedics? Just by accident, you know, when I finished my medical training, why I, I knew I needed to have a specialty of some sort. I had a friend who was an orthopedist, and so I thought, well, you've got to head someplace. I can always change my specialty. But once I got started working in orthopedics, I found it was the most fascinating specialty, and it was very rewarding. The patients didn't die. Most of them got better. And you could actually give people their life back, take away their pain, reconstruct their extremities. And it was a very personally rewarding experience. And looking back through the years, I think that probably God was guiding everything that I did because I would never have traded my years in orthopedics uh, for anything. It was the most wonderful experience, challenging, and and personally rewarding. Mm -hmm. And how many years were you doing that for? Well, from 1960 to 1992, I was in full-time orthopedics. I had four years of uh, residency training before that. So you're looking at about 36 years on a whole. Mm -hmm. And of course, on the more personal side of things, uh, you married and uh, raised a family. So how did that all begin for you? Well, I was just very, very fortunate to find a a wonderful wife. And uh, she gave me two wonderful children. And and then, of course, she, um, well, a personal tragedy evolved. And I lost her and uh, she died. And uh, then I found uh, my second wife. And uh, of course, I think God really provided her for a time such as this, because I don't think most people would put up with what my wife, Barbara, has to put up with today. And would be such a good partner in supporting me and helping me uh, to do my five hours of talk radio a day. Remember, this is very demanding uh, on your personal life. Uh, I really believe in some ways that God did give me a second wife who is willing to make the personal sacrifices that she is required to. But she's been a wonderful help partner, and we have reached people all throughout the world with our Radio Liberty radio programs. So you see, uh, you know, as I look on my life, God has always guided everything. I had my first wife and had two wonderful children, but I don't think that Marjorie ever would have put up with what we're doing today. And certainly, I'm just so fortunate to have Barbara. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing today, you said that it was kind of triggered by that experience that you had in the 1950s where you were seeing, did you say, Robert Welsh on the television, and he was speaking about uh, this conspiracy that uh, was actually going on behind the scenes. Were were there any other things that happened, any other events that helped to form this trigger so that you did see the world in a slightly different way? No, I don't think so. I think I was just very, very fortunate to have the opportunity to reach people, to contact them, to interview them, and basically to 
get an entirely different overview of what's going on in the world because most people look at the world as it's presented by the media, but that's not the real world. The real world is a very tightly controlled unit where a small group of people control both political parties, they control the media, they control the banking system, they control the corporations, they control education, they control the military, and they utilize all of them to pursue their goal of a one-world government. But behind them are powerful demonic forces. It goes back all the way to Nimrod, who wanted to consolidate the world. And, of course, God intervened at that time. There were repeated efforts after that, whether it be the Persians, the Medes, or, or the Assyrians, or soon as the Greeks, the uh, Romans, all wanted to consolidate the world. And God always intervened and prevented it from happening. And it's only recently that we've come ever close to what we have today. Because I think that these are truly the times that were prophesied 2,600 years ago. And when you had that experience back in the 1950s and you were tipped off to uh, the kind of thing that's going on, did you have an experience like people these days describe it as going down the rabbit hole, um, you know, where everything suddenly seems to be unraveling before you as you find out more and more of what's uh, going on and questioning more things? Did you have an experience like that? Well, I think that uh, certainly you've become disillusioned with everything you've believed. When you realize that you've gone to college, you've got an education, I minored in history, I really thought I had a grasp of what was going on. And then, of course, as I analyzed what was taking place, I realized I had no idea what was going on. I'd been manipulated from early life, and I had to just change my entire thinking. You might call it going down the rabbit hole, but whatever it is, I have an entirely different outlook than most people. I'm trying to convince people that they must become involved or else this wonderful world we live in will soon become a nightmare. And I suppose because of the timing of this kind of adaptation to your worldview that you had there in the 1950s, you were in a good place then to look at the killing of John F. Kennedy, perhaps in a different way. So when that happened, did you have suspicions about it at the time? Well, no question at all. I realized that Lee Harvey Oswald did not murder John Kennedy, and that somebody put Ruby up to killing Oswald. In fact, if you go down to uh, Dallas, Texas, uh, there's an area there where you can actually see an interview with Jack Ruby where he tells you that he was paid by other people to kill Lee Harvey Oswald, and that if they simply would get him out of Dallas, that he would tell the whole truth. Well, shortly after that, he suddenly dies of cancer. But there's no question uh, that they killed Jack Kennedy, they killed Bobby Kennedy, they killed uh, Martin Luther King. They killed people on a regular basis all throughout the world. They killed congressmen, they killed senators. They will kill anyone who gets in their way. I mean, we're not dealing with rational people. We're dealing with violent people who have an objective and a goal and who have no moral sense of what needs to be done. Well, actually, that brings me to a couple of pivotal moments that I wanted to ask you about in your intellectual development in these areas and um, because from dipping into your work over the years of course you've you know you've interviewed so many people you've given so many presentations that I've obviously missed quite a lot but uh, from what I have heard and I have seen of your work it seems to me that there is a, a handful of formative experience for your way of looking at the world and I have in mind here a couple of interviews that you conducted with two key individuals who I think that uh, most people who don't follow the alternative media will probably never have heard of them and I have in mind here first of all your interview with Norman Dodd who was chief investigator of the Reese Committee which looked into the activities of the tax exempt foundations in the 1950s and secondly your interview with the historian Anthony C. Sutton who wrote uh, those books uh, which have since of course become so famous like uh, Wall Street and the rise of Hitler and Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution. And um, so it seems to me that those men have had a significant influence on your way of looking at the world. So can we start with Norman Dodd? Could you tell us how that interview with him came about? And what would you say are the main things that you learned from that conversation with him? Well, basically, Norman Dodd was the director of research for the REACH Committee. He was the only congressional committee ever allowed to investigate the great tax-exempt foundations, that's Rockefeller, Carnegie, and Ford. And basically, of course, uh, when they investigated, they found out that certainly they were working to bring about this world government, to destroy freedom here in America, to bring about world government. And of course, eventually the investigation was shut down. But I had an opportunity to interview 
Norman Dodd, spent a weekend with him at his home before he died in 1982. And people can actually see that interview. We filmed it. Uh, we brought in the film crew from a large Christian university. And we filmed my interview with Norman Dodd, and it's available. You can get that by calling our 800 number, one 800 The same thing happened with Anthony Sutton. Anthony Sutton was a researcher who was a fellow at Hoover, Stanford University. So he had a very successful career until he began looking into the background of who it was that was responsible for the wars, who it was that was working behind the scenes, and he found that the great tax exempt foundations were involved in, in creating all of the problems. And, but when he began writing about it, when he went into the fact that we had actually helped to fund Adolf Hitler, uh, when he went into the fact that we had helped to fund the Russians and wrote books on that, why, of course, he was uh, fired from his job at Stanford University and uh, then, of course, was blacklisted so he could never get a job at any university in the United States. And this is an amazing, amazing thing, but it's, it's true. All of the universities interlock, and if you get blacklisted, you'll never get a job again. And that's what happened to Anthony Sutton. And we do have an excellent interview with him as well. Yes, indeed. I'm going to ask you about that in a moment. Returning to Norman Dodd, I wanted to read, actually, the paragraph in the interview, which I think is so astonishing, and then ask you to comment upon it, because uh, Norman Dodd said that he'd spoken with the president of the Ford Foundation, a certain Horace Gator, at the time in the mid-1950s, and this man invited Norman Dodd to his office in New York, and uh, he said to him, uh, Mr. Dodd, we invited you to come and see us this morning, hoping that you would, off the record, tell us why the Congress was interested in operating of foundations such as ours and, and then he said before I could think of how I could reply to him he volunteered the following he said Mr. Dodd those of us here at the policy making level have all had experience either with the OSS or the European Economic Administration in operating under directives the origin of which was the White House we today operate under such directives would you like to know what the substance of these directives is and I said yes Mr. Gator I'd very much like to know whereupon he said to me the substance of the directives under which we operate is that we shall use our grant making power so as to alter the life of the United States that we can be comfortably merged with the Soviet Union you know which is a, an astonishing statement there to make if, if that is indeed true and because I'm not saying it's not true but if that's true that's an astonishing statement I'm not absolutely clear what that means in detail so I'm asking you really what you understand Mr. Dodd believed Mr. Gator to have revealed to him there well, basically, the ultimate goal is a one-world government ruled by a one-world elite. And of they want a, a one-world financial system. They want to destroy Christianity. But basically, uh, the United States and Russia and all the nations of the world will be exactly the same, controlled by a executive group. Now, basically, of course, that's not the way America was set up. America was set up with the power of the government was to be limited so men could be free and we were to be ruled by God and basically people who are ruled by God do not need to have an all-powerful government and it's been said you'll either be ruled by God or you'll be ruled by tyrants and these people want to be the tyrants because they don't believe that people can look after themselves well we looked after ourselves pretty well for 150 years until the other side took over the reins of power and then of course is utilized of those reigns of power are to influence other nations throughout the world as we move towards this one world government. And so the Rowan Gaither told Mr. Dodd exactly what this was all about. We're going to have this one world system where both Russia and the United States are ruled in exactly the same manner by this power elite. And that's why Mr. Dodd said in that interview that their intention also had been to take hold of the education system in the U.S. and to push things in that kind of direction, in a kind of collectivist direction. And I, Yes, and I hope that many of your listeners out there would want to get our, our interview with Mr. Dodd. It's available from our telephone number, one 800 It's a classic. It's simply the interview with Norman Dodd. And uh, also in that interview, he was saying how they were talking about war as well and how that, in their opinion, this, this I think was the Carnegie Foundation at the time in the early, very early 20th century, just before the First World War, and they were saying that, well, war is a very good way to change a nation and they seem to be actually trying to push for war. 
That's right, and they created World War One. they created World War Two. they created the first Gulf War and the second Gulf War, and we're on the verge of World War Three, where, of course, certainly I fear that hundreds of millions, if not billions of people, will ultimately die. And people say, well, that's incredible. They find it difficult to believe and understand that we're up against organized evil. When you understand that, things do begin to make sense. Looking back at those days, do you think that it really was the case that those people, these trustees of that organization, actually had any idea of just how appalling the First World War would be? I mean, at the time, you know, I mean, I think when war was announced here in the UK in, in, in 1914, there were, you know, hats were thrown in the air and people were saying, hey, we're going to war, it'll be over by Christmas. I think people really don't understand how horrible war is. They said it would be over by Christmas, but they didn't say which Christmas. Uh -huh. There was no reason for World War I. The English people were tricked into the war. And then, of course, once England and France got into the war, why they said they wanted to bring America in. There was no reason for America to go into the war. All we did was prolong it and kill millions of more people. But certainly they wanted to have America and England and France joined together because they wanted to utilize World War I to bring about the League of Nations. This is what it was all about. The League of Nations was to be the world government. And when the League of Nations failed, why then they had to have another war that was World War II. And all during the Second World War, the United States and American corporations financed the Nazis. We had 100 American corporations working in Germany building the weapons for the Nazis before the war, during the war, and when the war ended, why then the American establishment helped the Nazis to escape to South America, where thousands of Nazi war criminals lived out their lives in Argentina and in Brazil, and that, of course, uh, what most people have never even imagined is that Adolf Hitler actually escaped, and we actually carry books by people who've gone to South America and talked to people who knew Adolf Hitler, who took care of Adolf Hitler. And I would say the best book written by a personal friend of mine, a PhD from Harvard University named Jerome Corsi, his book, Hunting Hitler, well worthwhile. We have a four CD set, Did Hitler Escape? People need to get that CD set. The Nuremberg Trials were simply a show to give the public the impression that we were trying to get the people responsible for the war the people responsible for the war, and many of them, of course, were Americans, American corporations, American bankers. Yes, in fact, I saw fairly recently, actually, that there has been an FBI release of documents relating to Hitler possibly escaping to South America. And I have to say, that is some interesting reading there that did seem to be at an extremely high level in, in the U.S. administration there at the time. Quite some interest in that and, and uh, wanting more investigation to take place. So that's not something that should certainly be discounted out of hand by people. That's worthy of research. I suppose what I wanted to ask you about this before we move on is that looking back at what Norman Dodd said there about the merging of the West with the Soviet Union, that can look like a contradiction really on the surface. But how do you understand that as being not a contradiction? Well, I think that eventually why we're going to have a war with Russia and then we're going to have peace with Russia and then we're all going to live happily together under this new one world government. That's what's coming. And it's really not a contradiction I mean, the, the Russian people are good people. The American people are good people. What people really don't understand is that communism has been funded by the United States since its inception back in 1917. And this is well covered in my book, Brotherhood the Hood of Darkness. And under one guise or another, ever since 1917, the West has been funding the communists. Basically, of course, we were told that Communism broke down in, uh, in 1990, 1991. But what nobody tells you is that certainly at that point, American banks and corporations went over and drilled the oil wells and the natural gas wells in Russia that made Russia either the largest or the second largest oil and natural gas producer in the entire world. And their entire economy is based upon the oil and wells and gas wells created for them by American corporations and American banks. We have literally thousands of American corporations operating in Russia today. 
and directing what goes on behind the scenes and directing the course of the government. But the average American, the average Russian has no idea. What you're saying here essentially comes from Anthony Sutton's uh, investigation into this matter, I believe. Is that right? That's in part, but uh, certainly the um, President Sutton uh, had died or was about to die when, of course, we were drilling the oil wells and natural gas wells. But it was American corporations that went over and actually drilled the oil wells to get them back economically sound again. And Russia exists today because of constant infusion of money and technology from the United States. Now, my understanding about Professor Sutton's main thesis here was that the corporate power of the West, the U.S. in particular, their reasoning was that it was a good idea to give support to the socialists, the uh, the communists, because they believed that these systems were unproductive, inherently unproductive. And so if you encouraged a build-up of communist infrastructure in the Soviet Union and indeed uh, in national socialist Germany, then these potential giants, of course, particularly the Soviet Union as a, as a real giant of industrial output, uh, they would no longer be there as rivals on the world industrial stage. They'd be neutralized because they'd be so unproductive. And so he said that they would be captive markets markets. Do you think that that really was their main strategy there? They were actually trying to neutralize the Soviet Union? Well, that may be one of them, but of course, another major strategy was that they wanted a potential enemy, or at least an apparent enemy, so that you could rally the American people behind the military-industrial complex here in the United States. As long as you have that enemy over in Russia, then we need an all-powerful U.S. military. And basically, of course, the people have to rally behind our government that is protecting us from the, the wicked communists who want to take our freedom. That is what the average American believes. That's not the truth. There is no wicked communist enemy. We created it, we financed it, and it would certainly crumble and totally fail if it wasn't. We were constantly giving it both uh, money and certainly technology. And if we weren't doing everything we could to have maintain Russia, they would have collapsed back in the 1930s. Socialism is not the efficient system, but we need an enemy. You always need an enemy to rally the people behind the government. And that's really what it's always been about. And now that's exactly why we created this whole Islamic terrorist movement. Can we hear today a lot about ISIS and all of these terrible Islamic terrorists? You know, they recently beheaded a journalist, and they're talking about beheading another journalist, and, and they torture people, and they chop them in two. And, well, Sydney is ISIS is a terrible organization. And Sydney today, it is sweeping Iraq, uh, sweeping uh, Sydney into Syria, and probably end up controlling uh, most of that part of the world. It will have an influence in most of the countries over there. But nobody ever asks, where did ISIS come from? Well, fortunately, if you have a computer, you can go up on the computer, and we simply type in CIA funds and armed ISIS. You'll find that the CIA created this whole Islamic terrorist movement. Why? Because you have to have an enemy, and we have created the best enemy money could buy. And until the people in your country and my country recognize that nothing as it appears to be, that they've always created these enemies to rally the people behind the government and focus our attention away from what's happening here to what's happening over there. And until we can get away from that and look at things objectively, we will continue losing our freedom. I mean, all you need to do is look and see what they're doing. They're militarizing here in the United States. They're militarizing our police. They actually are giving them armored personnel carriers and tanks, small little towns of maybe 20 or 30,000 people, and they have an armored personnel carrier or a tank. They bought 1.6 billion rounds of ammunition. You can fight a major war with that amount of ammunition. They're arming our police with automatic weapons. Uh, they've put here in the United States probably a million coffins to be utilized so that they will have something to do with all the bodies when these events come about. And any of your listeners can go up on the Internet and check out any of the things I say, and they'll find that they're absolutely true. The elite know this major event is coming. They're preparing for themselves, and the rest of us are going to be so they have to fend for ourselves. And my job is to reach as many people as I can and get them prepared 
because terrible things are about to take place throughout the world. And it has nothing to do with the war between communism and, and uh, capitalism, because we've funded the communist movement and we're funding the Islamic terrorist movement. We need an enemy to rally the people behind the government so they will not see what is really going on. I'd like to turn to another aspect of your development in this. You shared with me on a previous interview, you said that you read a book by a lady called Constance Cumby, and that gave you a different dimension to this idea of world government, and you came to the understanding that there was an occult dimension to it. Could you explain what that was? Yeah. Well, basically, uh, Constance, um, I got in touch with her 30 years ago today. We were the best of friends. But basically, of course, uh, we, we looked at this initially as, as simply a political issue. And it wasn't until I read Constance's work then I began to realize that there was a supernatural element behind what was going on. And there really are supernatural forces directing the course of world events. And to me, even though I was a Christian, and I should have recognized the fact that there is this other dimension, I didn't consistently help me to better understand that we're involved in a spiritual battle that is being played out in a political, ideological, and cultural battlefield, but it is truly a battle against truly supernatural forces. And there is another dimension. There is a spiritual dimension. Uh, And that is, of course, where this battle between good and evil is being fought. And and we, of course, here uh, in this dimension are living in an entirely different world. But there is this battle, and the major force behind this move towards world government is the Antichrist, Satan himself. Mm -hmm. Now, this leads me actually to an interesting question that I have wanted to ask you for some time. I wanted to ask you how you understand this, let's call it a spiritual conspiracy here towards world government, because looking at the Bible, I understand that in the spiritual realms, it is indeed Satan's strategy to try and bring about a world government over which ultimately the Antichrist will rule for a short period of time. But I think some people suggest, and I'm not sure whether you do or not, but I'm asking you now, do you think that actual occult organizations here operating in the world are functioning as a kind of single source for this conspiracy in the world? Or is it more diffuse than that? Is that occult element here in the world only part of the picture? Well, basically, these organizations are occult, but not everybody belonging to the really understands. For instance, the most powerful organization in the world today is the Trilateral Commission. Maybe 300, 350 members from all over the world. I mean, I, at the people at the top of this really understand that this is a supernatural battle. I don't think the average person in the Trilateral Commission understands that. Certainly the largest organization is the Council on Foreign Relations. It's got maybe 4,000 members. It is a front group for a secret society that Cecil Rhodes created back in 1891. Cecil Rhodes was deeply involved in the occult, as were the people who surrounded him. Cecil Rhodes was a mason, and three of the four people who were with him were masons or involved in the occult. They knew what they were doing. They were bringing about this one world government. And basically this is carried on today, and here we are, well over, what, 120, 30 years from Cecil Rhodes creating the Secret Society in 1891. But basically the force that drives this whole movement towards world government is satanic. Yeah, I suppose what I'm trying to drive at here is that there are two ways of looking at this. You could look at it as the main spiritual force is operating on these occult groups and it's moving through those groups into influencing the world. Or you could look at it in a slightly different way in that the satanic force and influence, which has always been operating in the world, is influencing in many different ways um, through philosophy, through culture, in many ways persuading people that world government is a good idea and that the overtly occult organizations and their influence is only part of that picture. It might be a more concentrated action that's taking place there, but maybe it's a, it's actually a wider field in which uh, there is this satanic influence, if you see what I mean. Yes, I do. Well, basically, the major driving force behind everything is Satanism for thousands of years, but it has never come as close to accomplishing its goal of one world government as it has today. 
we are really on the verge of the establishment of this one world government. The one thing that's really lacking is this coming war. This terrible World War Three is coming and coming within a matter of a year or two or three years. I could be off. It could be longer than that, but I don't think so. I think that everything is in place for this last great war that is going to kill billions of people before it's over. Everything is lining up. It's not a matter of if, but when. And the Satanist hope that as a result of this, one world government will come about. And of course, we are told in the scriptures that it's going to be accomplished, that they are going to be successful at least for three and a half years. And when you say Satanists, am I right in thinking that you mean uh, Luciferians? That's right. That's right. Who, who at, the, at the end of the day are in fact worshipping uh, a false god, but there is a distinction, isn't there, between the two? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So I'd like to come back to this more biographical angle for the remainder of our time here. And uh, at some point, of course, you made the move that led you in the direction of Radio Liberty. So how did that come about? Was it some conscious decision to start broadcasting or did events kind of push you in that direction? A combination of both. And basically, I was always fascinated with talk radio as a vehicle for uh, getting information out. And back in 1960. Two, uh, when I got started in this, talk radio had just come to San Francisco. We had our first talk radio host there, and somebody said, you, you ought to go ahead and uh, call in and then talk to him. And I said, well, I don't know. I, I've never been on the radio. <laughs> well, he said, well, go ahead and call him. Mm-hmm. So basically, uh, I, I did. Uh, he was, a, he was a, uh, you know, he'd just come from New York City. He was a very articulate left-winger. And he had a way of humiliating and cutting down uh, everybody who called in or disagreed with him. He agreed with him, he let you talk, if you disagreed with him, he'd cut you down. And, uh, and so I called in and he cut me down. And so basically I called in a second time and he did exactly the same thing. So the third time I basically planned ahead of time everything I was going to say. And when I called in, why, of course, uh, he started to demean me and uh, ridicule me, and, and I didn't know what to do, so I laughed. <laughs> well, right. I mean, uh, people had, you know, certainly had done many things, but nobody had ever laughed at him. And so uh, as I laughed at him, he, he fell silent, and that gave me the opportunity to complete and put out the ideas that I'd started with. And basically then, as I was going to uh, hang up the producer on the program, I uh, actually said, wait a minute, I want to talk to you before you get off the program. And he said, look, we have a program here, it's for entertainment. So I mean, nobody has ever been able to take the host down. I want you to call in on a regular basis. You won't have to wait in line with everybody else. Call on a regular basis and uh, said me, get your ideas over. Well, basically, uh, I came to be known as Dr. Chuckles. <laughs> really? And for several decades, I was the uh, best known or one of the two best known radio talk hosts uh, of voices uh, on the West Coast here. Uh, then, of course, I had always wanted to have my own radio program, but I, I figured there's no way I'd ever be able to have a radio program. But one of my good friends came to me and said, look, there's an opportunity for us to get a radio license for a small a station here in Santa Cruz. Will you go in with this for me? It won't cost that much money. And we can have a radio station and get information out. Cost you maybe a few thousand dollars. And I said, sure. Well, of course, that was just uh, the beginning. That was to come on. It eventually cost about $30,000, but we ended up with a radio station. And as I started doing the program, well, of course, when you do one hour, it's just as easy to be on two stations as one. So we went to the local radio station and said, look, how could we get on other radio stations? And that began it all, and that's how Radio Liberty came about. And today we are probably on oh, 20 or 30 radio stations. Our voice is heard by the miracle of the Internet and uh, shortwave all throughout the country, and I'm so glad you have an opportunity to listen to us. And when would you say that you actually started radio broadcasting? Well, about 1992, so that's, what, 22 years ago. Mm-hmm. And where did you get the idea to have your introduction where you talk about the story behind the story and uh, you talk about dethroning the illusion and delusion? Where, where did those come from? Well, they're just ideas because they certainly are what's going on today. Most people live in a make-believe world. Most people believe they're getting the truth from the media, whereas the media is controlled 
problem. Most people have no idea that reality is usually scoffed at and that illusion is usually king. My job is to try to get people to think, and they may start out listening to us thinking we're crazy, and I like to say, well, before long, they're afraid we're not. And there's one thing that I found actually doing this program here, and I I think I really I've picked it up from your broadcasts, that it's important to create an atmosphere on the show where it's clear to people that you're not trying to tell them what they have to believe, but rather you're you're exploring and you're sharing information with them, and then you're leaving it up to them to check things out for themselves. And I've I've heard you so many times say, look, go onto the internet, go and get the books and check it out for yourself. And so. How difficult have you found it over the years to get that message across to people? I mean, have you had people thinking that you're saying, oh, you must believe this, just believe me blindly? How difficult is it to get people to realize what you're doing there? Well, I don't know how many people certainly agree with this today, but I know that we've reached an awful lot of people. We've reached tens of thousands, and that's all we can hope for with just one voice. Other people are doing similar things, and all I know is that we've reached people like you and you will probably reach people I never could have reached uh, and we have people doing similar things here all across America and uh, in Great Britain we uh, actually we do a program there on, uh, very often and out of Birmingham on Wednesdays and what a unique opportunity it is to be able to reach people all across the world and especially people who haven't actually have a voice like you do and what a, what a privilege it is for me to be able to do that. I've noticed over the years how sometimes you invite a guest on your show and you might actually disagree with that guest. And yet I've always heard you being very fair to that person. You allow them to have their say and you gently disagree with them. And I have to say I found that impressive. I, I wish all hosts would be as polite as you are with such people. Is that a deliberate policy of yours occasionally to invite somebody on that you disagree with? Absolutely. And yeah. if I can get somebody I disagree with, I want people to hear what they have to say. Uh huh. And have you found that difficult to control your sense of irritation with them? Yes, it's hard to get people on the other side really to come on if they know where I'm coming from. Yeah. And uh, and some of them know and some people don't. But uh, certainly most of our guests are people I agree with. But as you say, it's, occasionally we will get people people who are actually part and parcel of this criminal conspiracy. Yeah, in fact, I wanted to ask you that. Do you think that some of the calls that you have, because you have a call-in program, of course, some of the kind of troublemaking calls that you receive, do you think some of those people are agents provocateurs? Absolutely. Is there anything that you can say, well, I, that, that's the clue, oh, or that, oh, yeah. <laughs> something that tips you off to that? I mean, you, you, you develop a second sense, a second sense yeah. uh, after a period of time, and you, you can tell where people are coming from. Mm-hmm. And so they, there are a lot of good people who actually, I'm sure, have embraced this idea. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had a world government and we didn't have any wars? Wouldn't it be wonderful if there were no conflicts? Wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody had sufficient food? And they, they are truly idealists. And they don't understand that the people who are really working behind the scenes want to kill off the majority of the people in the world. I don't think the average person wants that. But there is a very small, well-organized group that does. And many times these people hold the reins of power in the United States and in Great Britain today. And have you experienced any other forms of attack uh, upon Radio Liberty over the years? Oh, I'm sure that there have been all sorts of efforts to infiltrate our organization. Uh, Fortunately, uh, I think that we've been able to uh, avoid that. On a couple of occasions, though, we have been infiltrated. Eventually, we understood what was happening and got rid of the infiltrators. I think right now we're fairly uh, uh, unique. In fact, I, we, I, we do not have any infiltrators, to my knowledge, at the present time. But I certainly there's always efforts to discredit us and to say nasty things about us. And I just can't worry about it. I try to keep my eye fixed on the ultimate goal. And that is, of course, to get people into a personal relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ, which is the only solution to the problems that we face today. And do you have a definite sense that this ministry has been led by and protected by God over the years? Absolutely. I don't think I would be doing what I'm doing if if the Lord wasn't with us and uh, was encouraging us and protecting us. And would you put a lot of that down to the prayer that comes your way from your listeners? I think so. And uh, we know we have an awful lot of 
people who pray for radio liberty and now as you know i uh, am on chemotherapy for you know, systemic cancer and uh, i have a lymphoma mm-hmm. and i know we have literally a tens of thousands of people praying for me and all i can do is say it's in the lord's hands well, of course, as we're speaking here, I'll, I'll issue that uh, request for many, many people, of course, who have a faith in God, who listen to this show. Please do pray for Dr. Stan. And as he says, it's in the Lord's hands. But if people could pray, that would be absolutely brilliant. Um, well, Dr. Stan, it has been a real privilege to have you on the show again and for you to share so much of your story with us, really, so many of your experiences. Of course, there'll be <laughs> a whole list of things, you know, as long as not just my arm, but, you know, a whole football team's uh, arms length of things that could have been talked about. Um, and I know that a good number of people have been looking forward to this particular interview because they've said in emails to me that they've been looking forward to it. So let me finally thank you once again for all the work that you have done over the years and, of course, are continuing to do there at Radio Liberty. And uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us once again on The Mind Renew. Well, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure for me. And I'm, uh, first, it's rewarding for me to know that you're going to be there doing the same thing when I'm not here. I'm 85 years old. I'm not going to be doing it that much longer. But to know that some of my ideas will be uh, then put forward by you and the people that you reach will be able to reach other people. All we can do is try to let people understand we're involved in a spiritual battle that's being fought on a political, ideological, and cultural battlefield. But it is a spiritual battle for the souls of men and the survival of Christian civilization. God bless you. Thanks very much for having me. God bless you, Dr. Stan. Thanks ever so much for coming on. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.